Welcome back to Bad Art with Sam. Today we're covering three topics that are a single chapter in your book and are all very interlinked. Propagation, antennas, and feed lines. This is the longest video yet, but it leads to some of my favorite stuff, so let's get started. Before we get started, we have to talk about yet another way to measure waves. Phase. Simply, you can sort of think of phase as the starting point for a wave. As you might have guessed, waves do not all have to cross the zero point at the same time in the same direction. When waves do cross at the zero point simultaneously, they are considered in phase. When they are not, they are considered some degree out of phase. The gap between when two waves cross the zero point is considered the phase difference. And when I said to some degree, that was just not a turn of phase, or phrase, sorry. Phase differences are actually measured in degrees much like an angle or a portion of a circle in geometry. Degrees are named after the inventor of the degree, Dr. Gannon Degree, who isn't from anywhere because they don't exist. We measure the phase of waves in degrees because waves are sort of like circles in motion. Let me call in a friend here to help demonstrate. If you think of the origin of a wave as a marker on a wheel, and that wheel rolling through time, a wave is what the marker will draw. If you put two markers on a wheel at different angles apart, you will get two waves at that degree of phase difference. By the time you get to 180 degrees phase, the waves are directly opposed. When waves of different phases are on the same frequency, they will strengthen or cancel each other out depending on where they are in their wavelength. When both waves are on the same side of the zero point, they strengthen. When the waves are opposed, they cancel each other out. As an example, I've created some sine waves in my standard audio editor, Audacity. In the first example, the top two tracks are two 600 Hz waves only a few degrees out of phase. The third track is the top two mixed together. Since the two waves are very close in phase, when they mix, they become a wave of the same frequency, only amplified. In our second example, the top two waves are both 600 Hz, but 180 degrees out of phase. In other words, they are directly opposed. When one wave is at the peak, the other is at the valley. They mix together into... nothing. The energy of each wave cancels each other out completely. If you think of this as part of how noise-canceling headphones work, give yourself an appropriate reward. I'm fond of lemonheads, personally. In our last example, we have one 600 Hz wave and one 1200 Hz wave somewhere around 270 degrees out of phase. I can't say exactly because I had to do it by hand. The mix has complex peaks and valleys and is an absolute joy to listen to. Phase comes up a lot in radio, shows up on the test, and is actually a bit of fun to play with. But now you've got the concept, so let's move on. Okay, let's introduce a completely new concept the atmosphere, specifically the ionosphere, which is quite a bit above the breathable part. Okay, so let's model some radio stations that might want to talk to each other. At very low frequencies, the atmosphere just absorbs the signal and all of your RF is turned into heat. The atmosphere might not need your heat. At a frequency that is fairly low, but not low enough to absorb, the radio signal actually bounces between the Earth and the ionosphere to reach a faraway target. This is how long distance radio communication essentially works. A single bounce in this manner is called a hop. At medium frequencies, the RF signal is refracted by the atmosphere, bending it. This is sometimes useful. At high frequencies, the RF signal passes straight through the atmosphere, allowing us to communicate with satellites and space stations. As a technician, most of your privileges are in the bands that support this mode of communication. Satellite work is a great introduction to the finer points of amateur radio and is one that I have never actually done. Perhaps we'll give it a shot at camp. The highest frequency that will bounce off the atmosphere and allow long distance communication is called the maximum usable frequency. This frequency is variable based on where you're communicating to, the time of day, and the weather in space. Frequencies above the MUF work on line of sight properties, much like visible light. The path between you and what you're trying to communicate with has to be unobstructed by things like mountains or the curve of the earth. Asterisk. When dealing with RF propagation, the curve of the Earth comes up a lot. Flat Earthers can't radio. So let's focus in on that line of sight type of communication. We're talking about VHF and UHF bands, and if you'll recall, VHF is 30 to 300 megahertz, and UHF is 300 to 3000 megahertz. So 30 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. If two of you are close enough that the curve of the Earth is not a factor, and you're talking with your new radios, there are still things that can affect your conversations with each other. Weather can affect radio communications in many ways. 
While negligible at lower VHF frequencies, rain and other types of precipitation can cause your signals to fade. This is known as rain fade. In addition to weather, the water in vegetation can also cause signal degradation. While we're on the subject, you or people around you are also pretty watery and absorb RF waves. We'll be talking about the safety aspects of this later on, but your small HT radios are quite safe to use. Since we get a lot of it in Washington, fog is water and also counts. Normally, if there's a mountain between you and what you want to talk to, an RF shadow is created preventing communication. But sometimes, the sharp edge acts a bit like a lens, diffracting the radio wave towards an otherwise inaccessible place. This is called knife edge diffraction because knives are pointy and pointy is required. Sometimes weather phenomena in your region create areas of charged particles that reflect radio waves that would otherwise pass straight through the atmosphere. These areas act like ducts in the troposphere, which is why it's called tropospheric propagation formally, tropospheric ducting if you're cool, or just tropo if you're in a hurry. Tropospheric ducting can go a long, long way, and 300 miles is not unheard of. Okay, let's say there's an RF transmission happening in a busy area with mountains, buildings, plains, clouds, people, glass volcanoes, what, whatever. Someplace like Tacoma, I mean. RF signals can and will bounce off all of this stuff on its way to the receiver. This seems like it'd be pretty cool since it means you'd get more of the signal, but there is a problem. Radio waves move at the fixed speed of light, and since they all took different paths to get to the receiver, that means they arrive at different times. And this is where phase comes in. Since they arrive at different times, they have different phases. And as you'll recall, these phases amplify, but also cancel each other out, creating an uneven reception that can change even with very slight movements in your environment. This is called multipath. In digital communications, multipath can create high error rates even if the signal strength is strong. If your drive to or from Radio Weekend takes you near I-5, listen to our station 95.3 as it comes into range and you'll likely experience multipath. Since you're moving down the road at high speed, the characteristics of multipath will change rapidly, creating something called picket fencing or mobile fluttering. It's very noticeable if you hear it. I wanted to get an example of it to you, but I couldn't do it in time. So it sounds a little bit like this? Artificial? Yeah. All right, now we need to talk about the ionosphere. It exists from 30 to 260 miles above the Earth, so visiting to see what it smells like is difficult. UV rays from the sun strike particles in the upper atmosphere, turning them into ions. Thus, the ionosphere. It is made up of several layers that are given letters. The layers we focus on are the D, E, F1, and F2 layers. The F1 and F2 layers exist during the day, but at night they combine to become a single layer. Let's talk about the different ways radio is bounced off of the ionosphere. When the 11-year solar cycle is near its peak, HF bands tend to propagate well in the atmosphere. When this happens, the band is called open, and at these points, the bands are open from dawn to dusk. When the bands aren't propagating well, they are considered closed. During particularly good moments, the F layers can even reflect the 6-meter band, which is in the low VHF at 50 MHz. Because of this, they call the 6-meter band the magic band. I think this is silly. At any time in the solar cycle, the E layer can become oddly charged up, creating spots of ionization for VHF and UHF to bounce off of. These patches can bounce signals, creating a multipath-like effect. It is called sporadic E, and because it's like multipath, it gives you the same weird phase effects. Radio waves can be refracted towards the Earth so hard, they seem like they're reflected. It's not really well drawn here, but this is called skip or sky wave, and it can happen just about any time and acts a lot like tropo. It works best with frequencies near the maximum usable frequency, so think around 10 meters. The atmosphere is a big place. There are a lot of hidden complexities in this whole program, but there are a lot here that we're ignoring. For example, the D layer absorbs a lot of stuff, but that's not on the test, so hey. Now we need to talk about super weird propagation that happens at UHF and VHF frequencies. There's two methods, and they both basically do the same kinds of things. They create super ionized sections of the E layer that create a mirror that radio frequencies can bounce off of. They don't last for very long, from minutes to seconds, but they allow line of sight radios to again transmit at extreme ranges, hearkening back to that asterisk I did earlier. When freaking meteors crash into the Earth's atmosphere, they create long channels of strongly ionized gas. This is called meteor scatter and can reflect signals between 1200 and 1500 miles, but they only last for several seconds. 
The other phenomenon is the aurora. It can last much longer than meteor scatter can, but is extremely variable. Both of these things are relatively brief phenomena. A quick aside about radio waves before we move on. In an electromagnetic wave, the magnetic field travels at right angles to the electrical field. This is a weird one to get over, and I'm not at all good at drawing it. You know, this is bad art after all. But there's something called the right hand rule that helps explain it. To use it, point your right hand like so. The thumb is the direction of propagation, in other words, the direction we want the radio wave to go. The pointer finger is the electrical motion of the wave, while the middle finger defines the magnetic motion. I tend to get lost in this relative direction stuff, so I just remember that electrical waves and magnetic waves travel at right angles, and that's what's on the test. Now we gotta talk about wave polarization. When we talk about the up and the down, positive and negative motion of a wave, we're talking about that electrical motion. When we talk about polarization, we describe the direction of this electrical motion with respect to the Earth. So, unsurprisingly, there is horizontal polarization and vertical polarization. Antennas generally determine how a radio transmission is to be polarized. If two line-of-sight stations attempt to talk to each other when one station is horizontally polarized and the other vertically polarized, there will be a notable decrease in signal strength because of this mismatch. HF signals that are bounced off the atmosphere return to the Earth elliptically polarized, which I also have a lot of trouble drawing. Again, this is bad art. This type of polarization is easily received by both horizontally and vertically polarized antennas, so doesn't pose much of a problem. Let us very quickly talk about gain. Gain, simply, is increase. When we add gain to audio, we're turning the volume up. When we decrease gain, or to be nerdy, we could call it adding negative gain, we're turning the volume down. When we talk about the performance of an antenna, we're often talking about its gain. The gain of an antenna is like the focusing of a magnifying glass to create spots of brighter light in specific directions. When we put a number on the gain of an antenna, we're comparing it to a theoretical isotropic antenna that only exists in our minds and in our calculations. But now we gotta talk about the unit we use to measure gain. You may think you haven't heard of it before, but I'm almost certain you have. It's called the Bell, which makes sense because it was invented by Mr. Bell Labs. Sorry, I, I mean at Bell Labs. It was originally used to measure line losses in telephone cables back when telephones had to be connected to a wired network. It's a logarithmic scale, which means that instead of a linear one, two, and three, it follows powers of 10, as in one, 10, 100, 1000, and so on. A logarithmic scale lets you show more values in an otherwise smaller graph, and is actually a more appropriate way to graph certain things like sound frequency plots. A bell might not sound too familiar until you know that they ended up slicing it into tenths to give us the decibel. Decibels can be used as a unit of measure for a great many things, and here are a few that I use regularly. When you see them on the test, you'll be seeing it in terms of antenna or power gain. We often just say dB instead of decibels, and I'll be doing that throughout the rest of this video. 3 dB of gain is a doubling, a multiplication by 2. 10 dB is an increase in order of magnitude, a multiplication by 10. So if you add 3 dB of gain to 5 watts, you'll end up with 10 watts. If you add 10 dB of gain to 12 watts, it becomes 120 watts. If you have a starting number of 12 watts, but there's a loss of 6 dB, that's halving twice, otherwise known as a quarter, so we're left with three whole watts. So we've talked a little bit about transmitters, things that make up radio waves, and we're starting to talk about antennas. So how do we hook one up to the other? We use feed lines. Let's talk about the properties of feed lines. One annoying property is loss. Loss is a reduction of power from one point in a feed line to another. Since all materials have some resistance to electrical current, this includes feed lines. The longer the line, the more loss there is. And the higher the frequency, the larger the loss will be. We tend to measure this loss in dB. Where does that loss signal go? It gets converted into heat. There are many kinds of feed line in radio. One historically popular kind is ladder line, so named because it looks like a ladder. It is two wires separated by some kind of spacer. But the most popular by far is the coaxial cable, also known as coax. Here is some now. Okay, that's a lot of cable. This is a run I actually use. Let me see if I've got a smaller section. Here we go. There are many different kinds of connectors, like UHF, which isn't actually very good for UHF, and N connectors, which are. Yeah, that's confusing, but like most really confusing things, it has to do with history. 
The inside of a coax cable is an inner conductor, surrounded by a non-conductive insulator, then surrounded by a conductive shield, usually made of weaved copper strands, and finally surrounded by a plastic jacket or sheath. All of these components surround the same axis. This is why it's called coaxial cable. Often coax is flexible. Some coax has a stiff metal tube that doesn't bend well in the center, and this is called hard line. Since coax is usually outside for most of the time that it's installed, the jacket needs to be UV resistant to prevent the jacket from degrading to the point that moisture gets in. Once you've got water in the coax, you've got a short and bad things happen to your radio. And now we really get into it. One aspect that we have to talk about, and that we have to deal with a lot when putting up antennas, is impedance. Let's say you've got a resistor, and you're putting an AC current or radio signal through it. The voltage and the current, the volts and the amps, are in lockstep, in the same time, and in the same phase. In an inductor or capacitor, this is not true. In a capacitor, the current leads ahead of the voltage a little. In an inductor, the current lags behind the voltage. The result of these lags and leads is a type of opposition to current sort of like resistance, that only applies to alternating current and is called reactance, because it is the circuit reacting to changes in the wave. The combination of reactance and regular resistance is called impedance, and is represented by the letter Z. Now that you know it, you'll see it all the time if you work with RF or audio. Nearly all radio circuits have both resistance and reactance, so we use impedance as a general term to mean opposition to current flow test question. All right, here's a big one. We got to talk about the bane of my existence when I set the radio tent up. SWR. SWR in this case stands for standing wave ratio. This ratio is the result of the impedances of all of the equipment in a transmitting system. So let's say we've got a chunk of coax here, and I'm going to draw it like a pipe or a straw, even though we know that's not what is on the inside. The radio is on one end and the antenna is on the other. If you've ever tried too hard to drink through a straw and hurt your cheeks, or tried to drink through a coffee stirrer on a dare or something, you'll intuitively know what I'm about to talk about. If there's a bad impedance match between the radio, the feed line, and the antenna, power sent towards the antenna will be reflected back at the radio. And reflected power is really, really bad for the finals on your radio. Thousands of radios have gone up in smoke because of bad matches, and modern radios will actually shut down if the match is too bad. The combination of forward and reflected power creates standing waves, and I'll dial up some footage of what a standing wave looks like. It's called a standing wave because the wave stands around like it's lining up for free choice time. These standing waves are dependent on frequency, so if you change the frequency of your radio, you'll change the SWR. The numbers in the SWR represent the ratio between the peaks and the valleys of the standing wave in the feed line. The optimum ratio we want is 1 to 1. This is called resonant. This is the goal. A ratio of 1 to 5 to 1 is pretty okay. When working on field day or at camp, I'll accept a 1.5 to 1 ratio on my antenna when I tune it up on a band. A 4 to 1 ratio? is bad. If I transmit like this, I've made a really inefficient outside space heater rather than a radio station. On an infinite SWR, what did you do? Is the feed line actually hooked up to anything? Are you using a potato as an antenna? Something is bad wrong. An SWR ratio is an effect of impedance and does not measure impedance itself. Impedance is measured in ohms, and the standard impedance for radio equipment is 50 of them. I repeat, radio equipment has an impedance of 50 ohms, or 50 ohms Z. SWR is measured with an aptly named SWR meter. I've got a nice one and a cheap one right here. SWR meters often double as watt meters to measure the strength of a transmitter, so they have to sit between the radio and the antenna. This is why they have two connections on the back. One has N connectors, the other UHF. An easier way to measure SWR is with an antenna analyzer. I've got one here. Just plug the end of the feed line that would go into your radio into the analyzer and the other end into your antenna. Dial in the frequency you want to transmit on and it'll tell you the SWR. Since I've got no antenna on it, it's got a greater than 25 to 1 SWR, which puts me back in potato range. If your SWR is bad and you can't change your system enough to fix it, antenna tuners are a good band-aid. They sit between your radio and your antenna, like an SWR meter, and can tune your antenna with some inductors to make a better match. I've got one that is hand-controlled, and an automatic one right here. Now let's talk about actual antennas. Here's a simple one, the dipole. This is the first antenna most people make. I've made several. Becky's made at least one. It is two wires hung in the air in opposite directions. To make an antenna work on the proper band, the links of the dipole have to be half a wavelength long. 
This antenna has some directionality to it, meaning that it transmits more strongly in some ways than in others. A dipole transmits more strongly from the broadsides than it does from the ends. Dipoles are horizontally polarized. Dipoles have to be up in the air to work, which usually means you have to suspend tens of meters of wire on poles or up in trees. To simplify this, an antenna can be strung up on a single pole or tree with the ends of the wires angled towards the ground. This is called an inverted V antenna. You just might possibly could have seen one. A couple campers and I built an inverted V for 80 meters in 2021. We built it out of garbage, put it up, and it was one-to-one -one resonant right in the middle of the 80 meter band at 3.5 megahertz. I was proud. The dipole is the simplest antenna. It is a die, pole, two poles. Get the joke? Cool? All right, let's move on. Another antenna is the ground plane or vertical antenna. If you ask someone to draw an antenna, this is probably what they'd draw. It often has radials coming off of it, which help create a connection to the ground. Sometimes this ground connection is made by a chunk of metal like the body of a car. The optimal length for the central conductor is one quarter wavelength. As a sort of hack, you can make the center conductor 5 eighths of a wavelength high, which will cause it to focus RF horizontally, increasing range. The antenna is called a vertical, and no surprise, it is vertically polarized. It is also an omnidirectional antenna, meaning that it transmits in all directions equally. You have definitely seen one of these. The primary antenna of the radio tent is an HF vertical I assembled some years ago out of a collapsible fishing pole. Since a vertical antenna for the larger bands is impractical, a 20 meter high pole would be pretty hard to manage at camp, there is a tunable inductor at the bottom to electrically lengthen the antenna. It is tunable for multiple bands and we've made most of our contacts on it. A not-so-simple antenna is called a Yagi or Yagi Uda antenna, named for Hidetsugu Yagi and Shintaro Uda, two 20th century electrical engineers from Japan. These antennas are very popular full stop, but these antennas are very popular specifically for long-distance communication using CW and single sideband on VHF and UHF, and they are really popular for the HF bands. This is because the Yagi is a beam antenna. It is strongly directional, able to focus its RF power in the direction it is pointed. A Yagi antenna can be rotated into a horizontal or vertical polarization, but most are configured for horizontal polarization to prevent ground losses. The last antenna we'll talk about is the rubber duck. It is the kind of antenna that comes with your radio should you pass your test. Since I have a large collection of portable radios, I also have a large-ish collection of rubber duck antennas. Rubber ducks are a lot like vertical antennas, and they work best when they are oriented straight up and down when you talk into them. As you rotate them towards a vertical position, they get worse and worse. Also, using rubber duck antennas inside of a car is pretty bad because cars are made of metal, and a lot of the RF energy will get ultimately absorbed by the car. It is best to use an antenna on the car in these circumstances. Frankly, rubber duck antennas just kind of suck, but they make portable radio possible, so it's something we have to live with. We call these sorts of things compromise antennas, and they are everywhere in ham radio. And that's it for one of my favorite parts of the hobby, propagation and antennas. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope more that you learned something. Please give the example exam a shot now that you've heard some stuff about antennas, and I'll see you in the next video. Okay, this is a hat. Just based off of the raw recording, this whole section was 23 minutes long. That'll probably boil down. I don't know that it's going to boil down to under 20 minutes, which means this is nearly half an hour. Yeah.